Welcome, uh, and uh, we're here for West Musings, 10-minute museum talks being presented by the Western Museums Association, and here this evening at the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. Our next speaker this evening, one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that we were capturing various and different aspects of what's happening in museums. Um, we started this evening with uh, Colleen Dillon Schneider, um, Jim Pepper Henry, uh, uh, representing First People, Indigenous leaders, Natives here um, in uh, the United States. Uh, and then um, our next person uh, comes from audience engagement Engagement, and we're going to wrap up with a registrar, somebody from the collections community. It's my pleasure to introduce here Scott Stullen. Scott will be joining us here from the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. One of the more successful projects that Scott has helped to launch at the Walker and indeed around the world is what he is now calling the Cat Video Festival, and I understand he owns the URL. Anybody heard of the Cat Video Festival? Okay, and how many people have watched cat videos on the internet? <laughs> Few more hands. Scott's gonna make it all make a lot more sense to us as he has for 10,000 people in Minneapolis, Minnesota recently. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, when I went to art school, I really thought I'm gonna be the cat guy. <laughs> and what do you know? Um, so thank you so much. And being from Minnesota, I appreciate the Prairie Home Companion introduction feel. It's very nice. So about two months ago, an article by James Denton went up, and it was titled, Why I Hate Museums. Some of you probably read this, but within it, and it's somewhat of a rant against uh, current city museums of being boring, he states, where's the muse, where's the theater, where's the joy? Well, five days before this was an article about museums going hands-on, where Judith Drabinsky in the Sunday Times talks about museums getting way too participatory on us. And she states, in ages past, art museums didn't need to be activating. There were treasure houses filled with masterpieces meant to outlast the moment of their making, to speak to the universal. So within this, what's a museum professional to do? <laughs> Now, in truth, both of these are really salacious articles, and they're trying to get people going, and they're flawed in their arguments, but, and the truth is, in museums, we have been about the business of relevance, connecting with our audience, and having value in our community for a very long time. But, in our digital age, what that looks like is changing. And I think that's really the root of this, and what I kind of want to talk about tonight. So, I work at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and the Walker, we've done several things you know, over our history, kind of trying to be inventive about how we handle different types of audience engagement, both in the museum and outside. So a recent one in the gallery, this is called 5050. So this is an exhibition where the audience came in and one of our curators and picked 50% of the show. I'll let you decide which side is which, <laughs> which also highlights a little bit of the tension between when you do activities like this. And this is a good effort, but the problem with this is, is that you know going in pretty much what you're going to get. This is one of those participations where the outcome has been pretty much defined. I'm more interested in the stuff that isn't. I'm interested in that scary museum stuff, the stuff you set out there and you really don't know what's going to happen. And I'm interested in that space where you have the museum world and regular pop culture, and they collide. I like that middle space where both sides aren't very happy. So there's been a lot talking about how people are engaging with digital devices, engaging with the internet, a lot in this conference, even the last couple of days. What I'm interested in is how you kind of mash this up with a space like this. So what I did at the Walker is was really looking for some sort of an experiment, a way of taking content that's generated in most of the time experience on your phone or on your computer, and it's a solitary experience. You might share it with your friends on Facebook, but it's really more of a solitary experience. So I wanted to find content that was readily available that we could crowdsource. So I found some content that actually, a recent study says, comprises 15% of the entire traffic on the internet. And of course, that's cat videos. I've learned, 
I've learned not to talk over the cats because nobody listens to me. <laughs> so it took this really simple formula, cats work, right? <laughs> and I didn't even see this recommendation beforehand, which might have been uh, somewhat handy, a little hard to read there, but people love cats. People love cats on the internet. <laughs> It's like, so this is, this is one of Momo's comment cards. I'm like, very serious. And you know what? They're doing it. There's several shows up right now that are catch-ups. Um, so what, what I did, what my team did, is that we put out a call for the first Internet Cat Video Festival at the Walker Arts Center. So we put up a blog, and this went viral in two hours. I was on the phone with the LA Times for a story in two and a half hours. And it took off. But... It's a big leap between that and what's gonna, and if people would actually come out. So there's a novelty in all of this, but would people actually come and experience videos they can see online for free, would they really wanna come and experience this in real life? And they did, 10,000 people showed up to the first event. And they came <laughs> with their costumes and their cats. And families came. And this is one of the most diverse audiences we've ever brought to an event. From families to the hipsters, the retirees, they all came out. <laughs> because it was this really sincere event, and they wanted to share this together. And we made the front page of the New York Times art section the next day. So when you have something that seriously, when we're planning this, I thought this was going to be me, a laptop, a case of beer, and we'd have about 12 people, and we'd watch some cat videos. <laughs> that may still happen, but when you do it, the first time, then it is to try to do it again. So we need to up the ante. So this year we couldn't do it at the Walker. So I negotiated doing it at the Minnesota State Fair. And the Minnesota State Fair is the second largest fair in the country behind the Texas State Fair. And we did it on the Grand Sand. So this is a 13,000 seat venue. And this year, I had 11,000 people to pay to watch content they could watch at home. <laughs> <laughs> and we upped the ante a little bit, brought in famous cats, brought in their creators, and then brought the people, the creators, and the cats together. <laughs> cats are cute. Kids are cute. Cats and kids, super cute. <laughs> it's like Voltron. <laughs> so then it also started getting these requests to take it on tour almost immediately after the first festival. So to date, it's been to 20 cities. I've got 14 more lined up for the rest of this year. It's been in film festivals in Vienna, Austria, and in Jerusalem. And here's one of the events, this is the Great Wall in Oakland, so we had 6,000 people come to that event. Here's our web stats. So this is what it means inside the institution. So that first one is a launch of our new website, which is a pretty big deal to the museum community. And then you can kind of see a big concert we do every year. There's the call for cats and then the actual event. It continues right now. We still have 3% of all traffic comes in the Walk Arts Center website is cat related. <laughs> And the media has is, is ate this up. So the initial thing, and I think I've given to date somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 600 interviews. Um, and it's been so interesting how it's crossed over. But the story's changed. The initial story was this novelty about, hey, the walker is doing this thing with the low art of cat videos. Isn't that you know, weird? Now it's changed to what is going on. And that's the second half of this talk. You know, most house plants receive better care than most house cats. After all, the cat is a thing of beauty, like a work of fine art. Context, <laughs> editing, and curation. That's how all this works. You need that wrapper to make sense of any of this. Why is the Walker Art Center doing some of the cat videos? You need this context to make sense of it. So to make sense of it, this comes out of a project that I co-curate called Open Field. And what Open Field is an ongoing project where we basically take an, literally an open field next to the art center and turn it into a community space where we do crowdsource events, we do things that are very community and socially minded, and it really becomes an open laboratory. And what it is is taking the public, the institution, and artists and putting them together and flattening that hierarchy and meaning it. So this means is we have an open submission process for the public that anybody can bring projects to us. And we don't differentiate between those and the solicited artist projects that we put out. We had to build the amenity, and through this planning process, we realized that beer is at the heart of any social space. <laughs> so we dug it up, put in trees, put in picnic tables, and created this social environment. 
We also built a tool shed. And within that shed, we have things like books, iPads, sporting equipment, things to activate your experience while you're there. And we created this environment that people wanted to actually hang out in. And one of the big successes of this project is that people quit just coming for an event or coming to see a band. They came because they thought something cool might happen. They didn't want to miss it. We create a few rules. It's good for platforms to have edges. And we create a really flexible platform, one that could work in different seasons, day or night, one that could work with different variety of crowds, and then also one where you can't tell the difference between the artist products that we commissioned and the ones that just happen, and even some things that just happen on their own. So in this one, we have sheep with a boom mic. That's a sound project by an artist of the sheep chewing the grass. It's the sound work. And the one next to it is the Gedney pickle that just showed up. <laughs> so just a variety of events from doing a iron pour, midnight drawing club, inviting an artist group to come and actually make works out of our collection out on the field with a chainsaw, bringing the local plein air painting club out to paint at the institution, different types of performance. This is live action role playing, LARPers coming to do an event at the Walker, square dancing, a Tai Chi class that would take place in the sculpture garden near the Dan Graham. Doing ghost stories at midnight in our James Terrell. 500 people doing yoga. Mowing the lawn is a, <laughs> is a sound project at Open Field. <laughs> we actually solicited the neighbors to come out with their push lawnmowers and fix them with bells, and we mowed the lawn as a project. And of course, to do some stuff that's kind of like fun and maybe a little, uh, little edgy too and a little just silly. This is a car break-in workshop for kids. <laughs> we turn our parking garage into an avant-garde jazz concert hall. And we did this project with Machine Projects based in Los Angeles. And what they did is they put a polygraph at the, at the exit of one of the galleries. And if you could pass the test and prove that you did not like your experience, we give your money back. <laughs> Nobody passed. Context matters. It is this framework, and it's the framework around all of us, and it's the framework around the Cat Video Festival, too. So one example is at the State Fair this year, Maria Mortati, who's a San Francisco-based artist, came and did a project where people actually imitated their cats, and then we mixed them hours beforehand. I was actually on stage stalling while we were getting this video done, which is really fun in front of 11,000 people. Um, and we, right before we showed the regular reel, screened this cat video of people being cats right before it, flipping it back around. One of my proudest moments is that I got 11,000 people at a state fair to watch some pretty edgy avant-garde video. So, the two questions I get the most often, the first one is why not dogs? And that's the first most asked question, and the answer to that is dogs are very bad in camera. Um, but the, the second one is, is this art? And I think, you know, really what they're getting at is like, you know, in a deeper question, a probing is that isn't there something wrong with doing this at a museum? And there is definitely some concerns with that. There was a lot more initial concerns than there have been now. But even inside the institution, it was a battle. And some of rightfully so. So it's the combination of are you know, you're just selling the name of the walker, or are you actually partingly destroying Western civilization with this? <laughs> really not a lot in between. Um, so this is what I like to show. There we go. Sometimes you need to be strategic within the institution. And I slipped this thing through before it, was, it could be killed. We kind of snuck this thing through. And nobody knew it was going to be as big as it was. But then it's once it has been the way, how do you take advantage of that? And the fear is, is this going to become this? And the truth is, it's not. And it's not an either or. You can have your cat and your mouse. It's an and. So in the end, we're not changing the mission. We're just expanding how it's fulfilled in a very different way. We're doing exactly what contemporary art institutions are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be educating. They're supposed to be being places where we can share and learn. They're supposed to be places of storytelling. That's what we do. And something like this, we made an egg glue for concerts for two people at a time. So maybe 20 people saw this, but the story goes much beyond that. And it's about joy and wonder. And I think that's something 
that we don't have enough of. And that's partly why this has worked. This is a quote. This is by Madeline Davis, who wrote for the blog Jezebel, which is kind of a TMZ type blog. It's, it's, she came there and she told me flat out, I'm going to shred you. And our editor had sent her to do that for the festival. In the end, she wrote one of the most touching pieces about it because she was converted. And she realized in the end, oftentimes when somebody does an event like this or like the Capitio Festival, we're having it in layers of irony or we're having a certain critical distance like you'd expect the museum to have. Why this worked is that's absent. And in all this stuff we're doing, it's about that joy. I love this stuff. And I want to share it with one another. These people want to share it too. They want to come and bring their friends. And whatever crazy thing that we're doing at the Walker, they want to bring their friends because they want to be there with them to experience it. Because it's not about watching cat videos. It's about watching cat videos together. <laughs> And that's why it works. Sometimes it's good timing. Thank you.